Our latest installment of JCTV features an interview with Brian Cashman that I conducted on Monday. On Tuesday, Cashman was immersed in a news development involving Alex Rodriguez. After A-Rod tweeted that his hip doctor told him he was cleared to play in rehab games, Cashman told ESPN New York that A-Rod should shut up and that the Yankees would announce when A-Rod was ready to play. At Yankee Stadium on Wednesday, Cashman addressed the A-Rod situation. I regret the, uh, the choice of words I used yesterday in my conversation with ESPN New York. I didn't with this one well at all, so I, I popped, uh, you know, and that's it. Alex grabbed Hal, and they had a conversation. Um, Hal reiterated about, uh, you know, the way he did it in a more professional way maybe than I did, um, but about managing from the top down rather than from the bottom up. And now here's our interview for Monday with Cashman. Here's JCTV. Brian, you're so identified as being the general manager of the Yankees, but I want to take you off the field for a second. When you were coming up, what was your greatest moment on the field somewhere? I don't know. I mean, uh, when I was in college, I had the all-time hit record for Catholic University. That was a kind of a cool thing to, to do, but it's in, since been broken But uh, by some guy that got drafted by the Blue Jays. But he didn't play the tough schedule I did, actually. So, um, so I always told the guys, got to have an asterisk next to his name. But I don't know, a number of different things like that, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, everybody remembers when they played football in high school, like, you know, a big catch or stuff like, you know, those things kind of stand out. But I'm always wired the other way. I think the, the negative stuff, whatever I didn't get done when I failed at a play, those are the ones that stand out more so for me. But doesn't that also motivate you in anything in life? So the things you fail about might kind of drive you to make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah. I mean, you want to try to create as many great moments, but I, you know, I always, you know, I always kind of forget the ones and you know that were really you know nice or helpful or whatever and and you always remember the one that got away so when did you know you wanted this job how old were you when you said it would be pretty cool to be a GM of a baseball team never wanted this job never to this date still want to, you know jokingly I don't want this job it's a lot it's a lot of pressure and stuff but I never aspired to be the GM of the Yankees in any way even when I was the assistant GM of the Yankees for six years I was never trying to become or take that next step. I mean, I, I got more exposure to, wow, you'd never want to be in that seat, you know, because you saw when things turned for the worse, you know, that the pressure was off the charts. So, uh, so I wasn't working towards this job ever. That's fascinating to me for you to say that you don't want a job that not only do you currently have, but that you're very good at. You look at your winning percentage as a GM, it's better than anyone's over the last uh, 60 years, I believe. But yet you don't want to do this. I'm smart enough not to turn it down. I do like what I do, uh, but you know, you just point out the winning percentage and all that different stuff. But uh, it doesn't feel that way, you know. And G. Michael was jokingly said, but it was there's some truth to it that uh, you know when he was GM, George got all the wins and he got all the losses, and it kind of feels that way at the same time. You know, when you're the Yankee GM, you know, uh, unless you you're the last team standing, you're pretty much uh, beat up along the way quite a bit. So. Um, I love what I do, and I like the challenge and, and the fight. And uh, but at the same time, you know, it's all or nothing. And and uh, and in this sport, you're going to wind up with nothing more than the uh, the the big ring at the end. And and uh, so that comes with a lot of you know, a lot of stuff. You mentioned Gene Michael and George Steinbrenner. Is George's voice still in your ear from being in that Yankee family and knowing what his expectations would have been? Well, he molded me. He trained me. He, you know, I grew up in this environment, and he created, you know, if there's 11 million people in the tri-state area, I don't know what the number is. You know, he's created 11 million Steinbrenners himself now because the culture has, you know, it was created by him. So uh, all you have to do is turn on WFAN, for instance. Uh, you know, when Mike Frances is on with the Yes Network, and and you can hear the callers, and they're all mini Georges um, calling in. Uh, to discuss, you know, the day of day's events and, and uh, the trials and tribulations that are the Yankees. So, uh, so he's in my voice. I've been molded. He's in my head with his voice, no doubt about it, because I was molded by him. But I, I got a lot of voices in my head now. So, and because he did create that type of expectation. Can you tune out the talk show callers, the people on Twitter, the endless cacophony, as you said, of? The Yankees lose one game, and sometimes it's as if you lost a World Series game. It's intense. Can you get away from that? 
Uh, yeah, you have no choice to to turn the uh, volume down, so to speak. I mean, I lived in Manhattan, and I kind of equate it to, you know, when the car alarms are going off all the time, you'd notice them. But after you lived in Manhattan for a while, yeah, those things, you know, if you had friends, I'm from Kentucky, you'd come visit, they'd like, how can you get any sleep here? But I don't even notice them anymore. So um, after a while, you get used to it. Uh, or you get a, you learn how to turn that volume down a little bit. Can you block that out? Yeah. Can you can you the car alarms, the the talk show calls, the car alarms, so to speak? Is it a, is it easy ever to get away from that for even an hour, for even part of a day? No, yeah, I wouldn't say it's easy. It's part of it. You know, there's certain things where you start to feel like when AJ Burnett was here towards the end, it felt like every five days was Game Seven of the World Series. It could be starts in June, July, or August, but he was being dissected so much it was almost suffocating for him to take the mound every five days here. And when it gets to that point, it's hard to deal with and hard to shut it out. I mean, uh, people have talked about everybody plays 162 games a season. Well, the Yankees play 162 seasons. And uh, that's the difference because of the media attention and the fans' interest and, and what drives us and creates this great behemoth of, of Yankeedom is also what, you know, is a challenge for us to, to overcome at the same time. So within those 162 game seasons, can you even take a breath? Say, for instance, if you have an off day, like today, which you're nice enough to do this interview with us, can you take a break, or is your mind always thinking, I've got to worry about this possible transaction. This guy is rehabbing here. We didn't look good at such and such in the last game. I've got to talk to Girardi and or Kevin Long about that. Is your mind constantly on making the product better? It, has no, it doesn't stop. It never does, because it's not just the major league level. It's the minor league level. You know, I spent the other day, you know, having to, you know, there's a domino effect when you have an injury or, you know, at any level or you promote a player, you know, you're taking from another club and you got to replace it. And so I think we've filled the Scranton club with, you know, four or five roster moves in a 24 hour period of, you know, we made a few trades outside the organization, signed a few free agents, got a couple guys to clear outright waivers and then had to convince them to stay with us. And so it was like about a four or five hour period where Scranton Rail Riders was the focus. Uh, and why is that important? It's because that's the next wave that if I have another injury, those guys are going to have to come up here and fill the gap. And, and so it is vitally important to keep yourself protected, and, uh, and it doesn't stop. It is as close to 24-7 as it comes. With all of the uh, transactions that you've had to make this year because of injuries and everything that has happened, has 2013, which we're not even halfway through yet, been one of your more challenging seasons? They're all challenging, to be quite honest, uh, whether you're – able to run out the normal team that is either performing up, spec, up to expectations or underperforming, whether you're running out a team that's not the team you expected because of injuries, no one really cares. The people are paying their hard-earned money every day to support this team to see a winner. And the Steinbrenner you know, you know, foundation of, uh, from their perspective is we're going to do everything in our power to deliver a winner. And um, so I wouldn't say this year is any more challenging than other. I mean, the circumstances on a yearly basis always change. Um, so this year there are more injuries than we've ever dealt with, but the challenge is the same nonetheless. You mentioned expectations. I want to throw a couple of names at you and see. I know you got to look into your crystal ball, but what your expectations are for them this year. Derek Jeter, will he come back, be productive, help you guys win in 2013? Couldn't bet against him. I mean, uh, this is a guy that's never had any failure in any way, shape, or form. So. So why, why not expect him to come back? Even though, you know, obviously it's a tough thing to ask, but why not expect him to be the shortstop and productive like he's always been? If he's healthy, that's what he's always been. So I would expect that going forward. And with all that is going on with Alex Rodriguez, can he come back, be a productive player, not be a distraction, help the Yankees win? I hope so. It's not like we set a high bar right now uh, in his absence. You know, we're running guys out there that are doing everything in their power to plug the hole, but, you know, right now we're running David Adams out there and he's struggling. So, you know, uh, you got to look at his, can Alex do better than that at the very least? I mean, before his hip, hip injuries, uh, he was an above average player at that position more recently. He wasn't the superstar he had been in the past, but he still was an above average player at that position. So um, the bar has been set pretty low for him to come back and do better than what we've already been running out there because of injuries and stuff. And so hopefully he can come back and help us. How do you deal with the losing? You mentioned earlier when I asked you about personal stuff that you kind of remember some of maybe the, the hits you didn't get in college as opposed to the hits you did get. When you lose a game in Major League Baseball, I guess the good thing is you have a game the next day, but tough losses that you think maybe you could have had an impact on, how do you live with that? You have to. I mean, I can't let it go like Mariano talks up, like as a closer, you got to have a short memory and turn the page. It's harder. It's 
There's a roller coaster of emotions that go on. So we had a game recently where CC we had the lead. CC Sabathia gave up a grand slam to Will Myers, and it was so deflating and and emotionally draining. But then later on, we come back with a big hit from Vernon Wells and win the game. So you're happy. You, you, you carry that stuff, whether it's good feelings or bad feelings, and the momentum of bad feelings can build up. If you get a four or five, six game losing streak, you really, it really, it gets you down and it affects your, you know, when I walk in the coffee shop in the morning and, and you know, people will see that, you know, I don't have that skip in my step. It, it just, it affects you. You have to try to find ways to let it go and, and uh, working out's important. You know, before I broke my leg skydiving, I was running, you know, three to five miles every day or every other day, and so now I got to do the bike. But you got to work it out one way or the other, but it's hard. It does carry with you. When you run, do you run with an iPod? Definitely. you got a mile left, half a mile left. You need a song that's going to carry you through that last half mile, and you're dying. What song do you want to come up on the iPod? It depends. My moods change all the time. So, you know, I'm into everything and anything. So I, I just let, let it spin off, and, you know, it, it doesn't matter to me. If it's on my iPad list, I, I can't give you a specific song because I like them all. You see, I'm different than you. Even though the song is on my iPod, if I'm struggling, I'm clicking that baby until I get something that, for that moment, I think is gonna kind of drive me home. Yeah, I. Uh, no, I'm usually daydreaming while I'm running, and you know, it's a, it's a therapeutic situation, I guess. I mean, the running is so good for the mind; it's ridiculous. Now I'm a biker until I can get uh, go, get back on the the wheel running. I'm hopefully close, but I can't do that yet. So therapeutically, those things help you. The, burning some calories, getting out there and freeing up your mind a little bit is, is a big part of getting through some of this. No question, and I've adopted the, the attempt of trying the challenge of guitar playing, so I picked up guitar, uh, guitar lessons this winter and I've carried it through, and, and it's, uh, that's a, another therapeutic getaway, and um, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's kind of like running, but, but in a different way. It's, it's definitely, you can get lost uh, whether you're trying to get a song down um, or obviously running or biking and that's that's the purpose of it people can do it reading a book you can get lost in obviously you know uh, whatever the book's about and um, the latest great novel or mystery and you know so all that stuff is very helpful because you have to find an outlet there's no doubt about it here's the true barometer though of your guitar playing skills will your kids sit down and listen to you play your guitar through a whole song I have not played for them yet because, again, until I, my staff has to hear it because I have the guitar in my office. So, um, so my staff has to uh, has to put up with that type of stuff. But I don't want to play for anybody uh, until until I feel like I'm worthy of being. You know, hey, I, you got to listen to this. I really have come out and I've gotten to the point where I can play it for somebody. Other than my uh, guitar teacher, Doug Allen. You know, if Doug Doug uh, has to teach me. He can, he can bear and listen to it, because I'm paying him to. <laughs> so. so to get the inside scoop, I'd really have to go to Billy Epler, Gene Afterman. They've actually seen you strumming away. Yes. What is your, do you play anything? Rock and roll, country, I mean, is it whatever you feel comfortable with? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, like right you know, knocking on heaven's door. It's, it's pretty easy. If you go to YouTube and type in like the top 20 easiest acoustic guitar songs to play, then I'm, I'm hitting that right now. And Is it Smoke on the Water, another one? I thought that was one of the uh, no, intros there, that they teach there's you. A few, there's a few different ones, and I'm, I'm picking them off one by one and trying, because, but, the, but the, the flow of the chord changes and stuff are relatively easy, so it's three or four chords to the whole song, and you can you know, transition fairly easy, and, uh, and the strumming's not that difficult. So, um, so far, I'm on, I'm on the basic level, so I'm, I'm, I'm crawling like a baby right now, but before... I wasn't even crawling, so at least I, I can get the chords down now, and you know, I can slowly put a song together. And so, you know, again, you gotta you gotta crawl before you walk. That's a very blunt appraisal of yourself as a guitar player. I would imagine when you're giving evaluations of players, you you are as blunt. But I have to ask you this, and this will be something that a bunch of aspiring GMs, aspiring Brian Cashman's, would love to hear. How do you get your job? What does somebody who wants to be an executive at the major league level? What kind of advice would you give them? Well, first and foremost, I started as an intern in the minor league scouting department during the day, and I worked security at night. The biggest challenge of all is getting your foot in the door, and an internship is the best way to do it. And then after that, I kind of tell people, it's like a surf analogy. The waves have to break your, your way. Um, I was not uh, trying to do this. I can put myself out there publicly and say, if I can do this, anybody can do this. You know, um, you know I worked uh, my way up the ladder. I worked hard. I, 
my my goals and efforts weren't for myself. It was to try to do everything my bosses gave me so I could make sure they got their job done in the best way they could and that they could rely on me to do that. And and doors opened up. You don't know who's watching you do what you do while you're doing it. And, and uh, I guess a lot of people along the way, like Gene Michael, for instance, and, and the boss, um, amongst others, Bob Watson, they all kind of liked what I was doing and, and therefore they opened more doors for me and gave me more responsibilities that I handled along the way and it's led me to this position. But I wasn't pushing for it, driving towards it, and in fact, quite the opposite, I didn't want it. Where do you keep your World Series rings? Uh, I have five, four in a safe, one's in uh, secretly somewhere in my office, you know, uh, wrapped around like socks or whatever, I'll whip it out for people to see if, if I have a speaking engagement or you know, somebody interesting comes to the office to say hello, but I don't wear it. They're kind of too big for me. I'm very proud of them, but uh, but I'm not type of sh I'm not showy like that. So probably don't even remember this, but at one of the baseball writers' dinners after that, you let my father-in-law put one of your rings on, and he still talks about it because what you said, the average person doesn't realize how that's a gaudy piece of jewelry that you're walking around with. I'm a little guy. I mean, if you're a big football player or a big baseball player, you know, it kind of tucks right in on their hand. But like five foot seven. You know, uh, they re really stands out. So, you know, it's you know, again, it's a trophy for me, uh, but I, I don't want to wear the trophy. Everybody wants to be an armchair GM, and then we got the armchairs here. But here's what we're gonna do. I got two packs of baseball cards. I got a 1991 score. I have a 1989 tops, which it feels like there's still gum in there. We're going to open one of these each, and then we're gonna have a little debate about who got the best card. You're going for the gum or the non-gum? I'm going for the gum. I knew you were going to take the gum. So whoever's got the, base, the best player. The best card. The and best we might, card. We might have to have a little debate. I mean, if I think a player is, is better than you, we, we might have to go back and forth on, on who's the best. Oh, 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 I am loving my leadoff hitter. Right, I'm going to throw this down here so we can leave the gum for the winner. My leadoff hitter, wait, my first two guys are both in the Hall of Fame, Tony Gwynn and Barry Larkin. Uh, that's going to be tough to beat. I'm, gonna, I'm off to a good start. Mike Sosha. Randy Myers, Scott Erickson. I I'm, I'm feeling very good about my first few guys. Kurt Schilling could go to the Hall of Fame. Dan Wilson, I did not rig these packs. You went for the gum. Well, you kind of pushed this one in my favor, so I don't know if you didn't rig these packs or not. Yeah, I'm struggling here, my friend. You've already won. You know what? Nolan Ryan. I think yeah. it's over. It's I not even I close. Three cards better I, came, I came up with one to compete with you in Wade Boggs. All right, um, Bogsy and Gwynn, you know what? This would be a great matchup. Yeah, Bogsy and Gwynn. Gwynn can cancel each other out. And then my next best player is Tommy John, who is tremendous, but, and Dave Steed. But you've blown me away with, uh, I can't even give you some of the other names here that, uh, that people wouldn't recognize much of. So I got Matt Williams. He was a nice player, but, uh, but nothing at the level of uh, what you've So this down. is a win for me, but I hope this isn't a loss that you'll take home with you.